This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his Old Testament History, Literature, and Theology course, lecture number 17, on the book of Deuteronomy, the institutions of Israel, and the various understandings of the concept of law. Okay, uh, for next week, you guys are working on, what, 1 Samuel? And we'll kind of clock on you so you'll be working on 1 Samuel and things. We're going to try to get through most of the book of Deuteronomy today. We won't be able to finish it, but we'll get through. Uh, t- there's going to be some difficult things to explain today. And so as far as cognitive stuff, this is probably the most difficult, uh, difficult day we'll have in the course almost. Uh, as far as cognitive stuff, it's some pretty heavy stuff. We'll be dealing with law and grace and the difference between the Old and New Testament and things like that. So some pretty heavy stuff. But before we get to the heavy stuff, let's do some lighter stuff. And it's not really light, but... I want to talk about, first of all, is uh, I want to teach you all the Ten Commandments so that you know the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are kind of like the foundation. They're called the general stipulations. They're, they're kind of foundational to everything else in the law. And so, um, basically, I had trouble memorizing the Ten. It's kind of like the Twelve Apostles. You kind of always lose one. You've got to go through them a couple times and things. And so I decided to make a kind of a goofy acrostic here for it. So here are the Ten Commandments, okay? Um, the Ten Commandments, big LC spams, okay? Now, um, for my generation, do you guys know what spam is? Probably people don't know spam. Spam, they put this stuff in a can, and it like stays good for like 30 years. And actually, you guys are probably eating the spam that was built back when I was in high school and things. It's just like nobody really knows what spam is, but you eat it, and it's supposed to be like a meat substitute. Uh, but anyway, okay, so big LC spams, this is how we'll do the Ten Commandments, okay? Just big LC spams. So the big, the big here will be uh, all about God, and so the first one will be no blasphemy. No blasphemy. No taking the name of, your, of the Lord your God in a light or trivial fashion. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know what to do with myself in your generation. I hear students, even on Gordon's campus, and my son just brought home a girlfriend that he had, and, and every other word out of her mouth was, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And everything, it was just, oh, everything. instead of saying exclamation point, people say, oh my God. Is that taking God's name in a light and trivial way? And I just, I I just, uh, let me just illustrate for you. A teacher gets up in front of a high school class in Massachusetts. You know, Massachusetts, how it is here. And a teacher gets up and all of a sudden the teacher bumps her leg against the table and she says, oh my God. Okay, is that allowed in a Massachusetts, in a Massachusetts school? Sure it would be. (laughs) Same teacher gets up and she goes like this. Oh my God. Question, is that allowed or not allowed? (laughs) <laughs> that'd be like she would lose her job, okay? And so I'm saying it's just really interesting. I think you need to think about using God's name and stuff and how you do it, whether you use it in a light and trivial way and things like that. He says, I don't want my name used in a light and trivial way. No blasphemy, okay? No idols. No idols would be the I, would be idols. Again, we don't worship Baal and Asherah and you know Dagon. We don't have idols of stone and things. Some people will say we have idols of like car, money, houses, and things like that. And you can make a, a case for saying those things are idols. I also think about the idols we make in our mind is way we conceptualize God in a way that is much less than who He really is. And you've got to be careful about coming becoming comfortable with your own way of conceptualizing God. First John. The ending of the book of 1 John, he warns us, beware of idols. And so I think that that is a really uh, valid thing. Actually, I've had to face some of my own idols and things like that and realize my own idolatry in the 21st century. So anyways, we're not doing Baal worship anymore, but we do our own kind of 21st century idols. So no blasphemy, no idols, no other gods before me. Okay, So no other gods before me. And those three then, blasphemy, idolatry, and no other gods, those are all, you know, kind of God-focused and things. Now, the LC, the LC is no lying, no lying. That's pretty apparent. No lying. No C, no capitalism. I mean, no, uh, uh, no, no coveting, no coveting. Is our culture built on coveting? Is our culture built on coveting? And so no lying, no coveting, 
don't covenant your neighbor's house, don't cover your neighbor's wife, don't cover your neighbor's stuff, and so no coveting. And, and this is a real problem in America, is everybody covets everybody else's stuff. And, um, and that's partially how our culture is built in terms of foundational stuff. So no lying, no coveting, no stealing, no stealing. Those people have the right to personal property. That's how you'd say it in a positive sense. People have a right to personal property. You don't steal their stuff, okay? Uh, does your roommate ever steal your stuff? Or, you know, saying you get, you get things like that. Um, you know, be careful. Stealing stuff, no good, okay? It's a sin against God, okay? There's no lying, no coveting, no stealing stuff. Um, and what stealing does is it says that a person has the right to personal property. So all these commandments kind of have, let me just take this. You shouldn't lie, which means, what, what, how would you put that in a positive sense? You should tell the truth, okay? So you should be a truth speaker. You shouldn't lie, you should be a truth speaker. You shouldn't covet other people's stuff to get it for yourself. Should you be generous? You know, you should be generous. And so, do you see how each of these can be kind of spun around and gone positive on? You shouldn't steal stuff, but you should rather be, you know, giving stuff to other people. Now, parents, honor your father and your mother, okay? Honor your parents is honor your father and your mother that your days may be long on the earth. And so this is the one that deals with parents. This is the only positive one. All the other ones are like, don't lie, don't steal, don't do this stuff. This is, this is a positive one, honoring your father and your mother. It's a big thing. And, you know, it gets into the question, of what, what do I do when my father and mother are not honorable? You know, my mother was a drug addict, and my father walked out on me and stuff like that. So you just, it gets to be a real difficult situation. Can you, uh, how you would honor, um, how you honor parents and things like that. It's, it's a tricky, tricky situation. No adultery. A is for adultery. No adultery. Jesus speaks on this in the, in the New Testament. Jesus says, you have heard it said of old times, thou shalt not commit adultery. But what does Jesus say? But I say unto you, he who's looked on a woman lustfully in his heart has committed adultery already in his heart. Jesus takes these commandments and drives them into the heart. He doesn't say, oh, I've never committed adultery because I've never been married, you know, and things. Jesus says, you've committed lust, you've already committed adultery and stuff. So adultery, by the way, in our culture, in our culture do we actually applaud adultery? Are half of our movies about adulterous situations and things? And so uh, in the old days, they used to wear a red letter on them. Now you're a hero. You're going to, you know, dance with the stars or whatever. You're, you know, and that, was, that was a bad association because it doesn't, not all the people on there are that way, but... You know what I'm saying? You become a hero. In our culture, in our culture, the celebrities, they turn over wives and turn over husbands and stuff, and it's kind of like applauded almost. So adultery, be careful about adultery. No murder. No murder is the M. Now notice, does the Bible say thou shalt not kill, or does it say thou shalt do no murder? It says no murder, okay? Is there a difference between killing and murder? Did, is, did the Israelites, did they kill people in war? Did the Israelites kill people in war? Were they violating this commandment? No, God told them in some of the cases to go out to go to war. Um, another case that I would use, like myself, and I fear going down Grapevine Road, a kid's riding his bike. These kids ride their bikes now, and all of a sudden the kid swerves in front of my car, and I run the kid down, and I kill the kid. Question, have I murdered the kid? Now, is the kid dead? Kid's dead, I rode my car over him and stuff like that. The kid's dead, so I killed him, but did I murder him? Murder implies hatred or malice and a forethought, those two words, malice and a forethought. In other words, I didn't have anything, you know, mal there was no malice in my heart toward this kid. I just, he happened to swerve in front of me, I couldn't stop and things. So malice and a forethought. In other words, you plan it ahead of time to kill the person, and so malice and a forethought, and uh, that's murder. And so you've got to make a distinction between killing and murder. By the way, do our laws in America make a distinction between killing and murder? Yeah, and do we have different degrees of murder and different degrees of killing and stuff? Can, what if I, uh, okay, um, an old uh, elderly, I want to say this respectfully for the honor of your parents and stuff. Um, suppose, you know, oh, this would be really bad. Um, okay. Um, suppose my, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law's got Alzheimer's, okay? Good or bad? Bad. Really bad? Really bad, okay? Suppose she got in the car and started driving the car. Now question, could she kill somebody? Could she kill herself? Okay, 
what would happen is that suppose she hit the gas pedal instead of the brake and she missed it because her coordination's gone and stuff, could she actually ram into somebody and, and kill them and things like that? Would she be considered a murderer? Now, by the way, should she be driving a car? No. So I, that was a bad illustration, but what I wanted to say is, let's suppose a person gets drunk and goes out drives, and they're drunk driving and they kill somebody. Question, are they a little more responsible than my mother-in-law who's got Alzheimer's? You know what I'm saying? She was totally out of her wits. Now, she shouldn't have been driving the car in the first place, okay? But a person that's drunk, are they more responsible? You know what I'm saying? Because there's neglect there, there there's, there's certain neglect. Did they do it with malice and a forethought? No, the problem was there was no thought, you know, okay? And so there's, in other words, if you do something that's stupid that hurts somebody else, you know what I'm saying, then they have different levels of, uh, you know what I'm saying, there's different degrees of murder and killing and stuff like that. that you're, so no murder, okay, murder, malice, and a forethought. And then lastly, the last one is the S, is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So the Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments. And so, frankly, I find this really easy and things, Ten Commandments, big LC spams, right? And can you think through it that way? Yes, sir, Peter. LC, Library of Congress. What's that? No, lying? <laughs> Li no. Were you asking for the Library of Congress or were you asking for the real? Oh. Yeah, it's just, no, it's just LC. Yes. Big LC spams, lying and coveting. So, yeah, all right. Now, okay, moving on. Another general stipulation, and so I want you to know the Ten Commandments. Um, another general stipulation and that is what's called the Shema. Every Jew in the world, I swear, knows these verses. This is the John 3.16. If you're Jewish, Deuteronomy 6.4, Shema Yisrael, and this is called the Shema, because the first word means, Shema means to hear. Hear, O Israel. Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. Um, do some of you know, like if you go over to a doorpost over here, have any of you gone to a Jewish house and when you go in the doorpost, there's a, like a little W on the door, and you see them go like this and like that. Does anybody ever go to a Jewish house and you see them touch the doorpost where there's this, this looks like a W. The letter W in Hebrew is this SH sound, okay? It's a SH sound. And what, when you go into a Jewish house, they will have a little, this SH um, letter, it's, it looks like a W, and it'll be on their door, and that's to remind them when they enter the house, they are to remember what? Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. And so they'll go and they'll touch it and kiss their hands like that and stuff like that. You'll see them when they go in the house and stuff. So it's, it's just another way to remember scripture. They'll put the little W on the door or it's an SH for the Shema. So hero Israel, Yahweh is our God. By the way, what's the next verse after that? Yahweh is our God, hero Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. And you shall what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and stuff. And so it goes on then. This is the great command of God, to love the Lord your God with all your heart. So this is part of the Shema, okay? Shema, those are general. Now, as there are broad, the Ten Commandments, very broad foundational uh, laws for society and for Christianity, Judaism, and things, um, there's also now Moses... Um, is there's a huge transition happening where Moses is giving the reins over to Joshua. Moses is handing the reins of leadership over to Joshua, and there's going to be a big transition. As Moses is letting go, what he does is he sets up the institutions. Moses is over here on Mount Nebo. They're going to be going down in, across the Jordan River over to Jericho, and, and Moses can't cross the Jordan River. So he's up on Mount Nebo, and he's looking over Israel. This is, you guys, the land of Israel. And basically what he does is he sets up the institutions. In other words, this is almost like a, a what do we call it, a constitution, where Moses is saying, when you get into the land, these are the institutions that are going to rule your country. And so Moses sets up these institutions in the Mosaic Law, and these are the institutions of Israel. The first institution he sets up are the prophets. And in chapter 13, we see what Moses has to say about the prophets. He says, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder which he has spoken takes place. So the guy comes to you and he announces that he's had a dream 
and he, then he announces the miracle, and the miracle actually happens. Is the guy a true or false prophet? You still don't know, do you? Is it possible, he says, that this guy does a miraculous sign of wonder, and if the sign of wonder, which he has spoken, takes place, and he says, let's go after other gods, is he a true or false prophet? He's a false prophet, because what he said contradicts Scripture. What he says contradicts God's previous revelation. God said, when he says, go after other gods, what did the Ten Commandments say? You shall have no other gods before me. Okay? So you know the guy's a false prophet. What happens with false prophets? He says, the Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you will love him with all your heart and soul, with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere or fear. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death. False prophet. Okay? Is Moses warning them that there would be prophets in the future, but that he warned them that some of them would be false prophets? Okay. Uh, what's the difference between a false prophet and a true prophet? How, what are the number values? How many false prophets to every true prophet? Did Israel have a lot of true prophets and very few false prophets? Or did they have a ton of false prophets and a very few true prophets? Does anybody remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel? And there's 400 prophets of Baal. There's one Elijah against the 400 prophets of Baal. So this is, uh, this is how it goes in Israel. And by the way, if you had to summarize, what is the message of the true prophet? The false prophet was supposed to be what? Killed. What did Israel do to the false prophets? They applauded the false prophets. Who did they kill? The true prophets. What was the message of the true prophet? If I could summarize the message of the true prophet into one word, this is really crass. But if I could summarize it in one word, it would be the word what? Shuv, repent, okay? So the real prophet gets up, he says, repent to the people. What do the people do? They beat, they beat the tar out of them, okay? So that's the true prophet. Now the false prophet, there are many false prophets, and what do the false prophets say according to the book of Jeremiah? Yeah, exactly. It's all right, peace, love, harmony, peace. And, and so Jeremiah says, the false prophets say, peace, peace, when there is what? No peace. The ones that are always proclaiming peace and love and all these wonderful things, what does Jeremiah says? Those guys are the false prophets. The true prophet says repent. And so what I'm saying is it's, it's really interesting, this contrast between the true and false prophets. Israel had a lot of false prophets. <laughs> the false prophets, they applauded. The true prophets, they ended up killing a lot of them and doing various things. Isaiah, does anybody remember the story of Isaiah? Isaiah was fleeing from this is rumor, it's not in the Bible, okay? So I'm not sure, you know what I'm saying? This is what legend tradition has, but um, part of it comes out of the book of Hebrews. Isaiah was fleeing from King Manasseh. He basically, Manasseh was a really nasty, bad king, and Isaiah basically, you know, this guy's bad and stuff, so he's fleeing, Isaiah's fleeing. And so Isaiah hides in a tree. He hides in the stock of a tree, and what happens is Manasseh's men catch him, seize in a tree, and so what do they do? They take a saw, and they cut the tree in half, okay? And so, actually, the book of Hebrews refers to some of them were sawn asunder. That's Isaiah that writes the big book of Isaiah. Gets, anyways, okay, let's get out of there. Okay, now, the other passage that Moses brings up about the prophet is this, and this is a good passage, too, in chapter 18. He, Moses explains what a prophet does, and he says in chapter 18, down to verse 17 here, it says, the nations who will dispossess you dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery and divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to, you don't do sorcerers, you don't do divination. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses. God says, God, Moses says, God will raise up a prophet for you guys like me. Okay? You must listen to him, for this is what you asked for the Lord your God at Horeb and stuff. And then verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among all their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth. What was a prophet to do? The prophet had God's word put in his mouth. Therefore, the prophet said what? Thus saith the Lord. Okay, is that how much of the prophets say, this is an old King James way of saying it, thus saith the Lord, because the 
God put his words in the prophet's mouth. The prophet spoke for God. That's what prophemi means. He speaks for God. He speaks in place of God, the prophet does. And Moses says, God's going to raise up a prophet like me. When Jesus comes along, does anybody remember what the Jews asked Jesus? They said to Jesus, Jesus, who are you? Who are you, Jesus? Are you the prophet? What is the, the prophet? Who is the prophet? The prophet comes right out of here from Deuteronomy chapter 18. God told them that he would raise up a prophet like Moses. And so they asked Jesus, are you the prophet who is to come? Or are you the Messiah? Are you the son of David? Or who are you? Are you the prophet? So this, this passage gave some expectation that the Jews were expecting this, the prophet, to come up, that God would put his words in his mouth. And they asked Jesus, are you the prophet? Jesus said, what? No. Okay. And so, uh, some, yeah, anyway, so it's an interesting passage there. Here's a second institution that Moses sets up back in chapter 16, actually 16, verse 18, is a second institution, and this is the institution of the judgeship. Now, by the way, was Moses a prophet? Yeah, Moses was a servant of the Lord. He's a big prophet in the Old Testament. Moses is among the, the best, the biggest. And was Moses also a judge? Does anybody remember in the book of Numbers that God took the spirit off him and put him on the 70 and, and then 70 people judged because Moses was judging all the people and he got just weighed down by that? And so here he gives some instructions for judges. He says, you're going to have judges. And in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18, he says this. Appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town. In every town. Was justice to be local? was just to be local. Every town was to have a judge. Why would you put judges in every town? So that justice is accessible to the people. Every town had a judge so that you, you know what I'm saying, so that you didn't have to run 20 miles to get justice. It was in your own local locality. So he says, put a judge in every town that God is giving you and they shall judge the people fairly. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe. So the big thing for the judge was that a judge was to positively judge fairly with justice and negatively the judge was not to accept a bribe. Is money and are money and justice to be connected to each other? Or what does the scripture say? Money and justice. Should money and justice be connected or should they be disconnected? Okay. In our culture, once upon a time I was teaching in Indiana State Prison, maximum security prison. Guys were sitting in a class, and I came up and I said, well, in America, it's really good in America, because in America, bribing, you know, you don't bribe, you don't bribe judges in America and stuff. Uh, guess what those guys did in prison? They laughed at me. They said, you want to know the judge, you want to know how much. And now you say, well, these guys are on prison, probably because they were bribing. It. Okay, but what I'm saying is, is money and justice connected in America? The honest truth is, um, let me tell you a story of one of my friends. Um, he was in prison. He was in prison, supposed to be for 50, I think it was 15 years. He had been in prison for eight years, okay? Uh, he swore he was innocent, swore, absolutely swore he was innocent. A lawyer then came to his parents, uh, he came to his parents, and they said, for $20,000, we've got a technicality that can get your son out of prison. How many of you, if you were parents, would pay $20,000 to get your son out of eight years of prison, maximum security prison? Would you pay the money? $20,000. Yeah, sure. You think what your parents pay, you send you to Gordon College. So you, they get off cheap like that. Anyways, $20,000. $20, okay. Sorry, that was supposed to be a joke. It was a sick joke, but okay. All right. Nobody's laughing. Everybody's ready to throw. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. But no. So the parents paid the $20,000. Guess what happened to the lawyer? He comes back to them and says, I almost got this case, but we're going the wrong direction. I found another direction, another $20,000, and I can get him out. I, I can do it. Question, did they come up with a second $20,000? They came up with a second, and then when the second was hit, they, he came back a third time. This is the honest truth. Came back a third time and said, I've got it now. I've got it nailed. 20 more thousand, I can get him out of jail with $60,000. Question, do you know what those parents did? They went out and took a mortgage, a second mortgage on their home to get money to, guess what? Question, I was, at the, I was at the trial. Question, did he walk out of there a free man? 
He walked out of there a free man. I'm serious. The guy got him off, $60,000. And on the third try, the, ju the, the guy got the course, the case thrown out, and he was exonerated, and he got out. Question, is money? Question, if he had been a poor man, if he had been a poor man, would his tail still be in jail? But because his parents had money, question, were they able to get him out of jail? Is money and justice connected? You say, well, that's not right. It shouldn't be like the question, is that the way it is? It's one of my favorite songs. It's called, That's Just the Way It Is. That's just the way it is, and that's the way it is, okay? Now you say, well, that's just your friend. That's my friend here um, in Indiana State Prison. From my generation, we only have to say two letters. Is money and justice connection just two letters? O, J. I'm sorry, that's my generation. That's my generation. Question, is money and justice connected? Is money and justice connected? If you're a poor person, if you're a poor person, does your tail go to jail? If you got money, do you get out of jail? Is that pathetic? What happens if you're a celebrity? What happens if you're a celebrity? You're a celebrity and you do something wrong. Do you get like uh, passed by, like, oh, it didn't really mean it and it was all, and so you get like, oh, we don't really put you in jail. We'll give you, let's see, what do they call that? Community service. We won't put your tail in jail. You'll get community service because you're a celebrity and you didn't know any better. And just you were maybe, who knows what you were on. And so therefore we'll let you go, okay? And what happens if you're really a celebrity and you've become famous because of your case. And once you become famous, will you get some of the best lawyers in the country seeking you out because you're so famous to get you off, and they are a defense lawyer, and they get you off. Can you even, I better not even say it, can you even, can you get away with murder and walk? Yeah, and you write a book about it, you make a million dollars. Okay, is that, or make a movie on it and that kind of stuff, okay? Is there something, does something in your gut tell you that in America something's wrong with this justice system? Okay, what I'm saying is Moses says money and justice should not be connected. Money and justice, there should be no bribing, the money and justice should not be connected. What I'm saying is, it seems to me in our culture, money and justice are connected. And I could give you, believe me, I could stand here and tell you case after case after case, actually one of them even happened to me. And, um, and it was right in my face, and the guy just laughed at me because he knew I didn't have enough money to make it right because it would have cost me ten, twenty thousand $20,000 to make it right. He knew he was wrong, but he knew I couldn't afford to hire a lawyer. And so the guy took advantage and stuff. Did he win? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the way, that's just the way it is. Okay, sorry. So Moses says, money and justice, not connected. Moses also says, hey, you guys, set up cities of refuge. And so on the... East Bank over here in Jordan set up some cities, three set up some cities over here on the West Bank of the Jordan in these places. And then if you kill somebody accidentally, suppose you're out with an axe, this is a classic example, you're out with an axe head and all of a sudden the axe head flies off and hits somebody and kills somebody, then you run where? Where do you run? You run to the city of refuge. In the city of refuge, the elders of the city of refuge come out. They, they talk through your case and things. And if you are innocent and stuff, and the avenger of blood, now who's this avenger of blood guy? Like if somebody killed you and stuff like that, do you realize that then the family members would come after you? And there would be an avenger of blood from the family of the person you killed come after you and basically kill you. And so when you went into the city of refuge, did the city then protect you? And the avenger of blood was not allowed to kill you, okay, if you were in the city of refuge. Now, what happens if you killed somebody on purpose and you fled to the city of refuge? The elders go through the case, and if the elders say, you, you're, you know, you killed the guy on purpose, the guys, the elders hand you over to the avenger of blood, okay? So that's no good. So you only want to go to these cities of refuge if you were innocent. But anyways, if so, if you were innocent, you could go to a city of refuge and be protected from the avenger of blood, Okay. So cities of refuge, pretty important. Now the kings. In chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, we get the law of the kings. Was there a king in Israel in Moses' time? No. Actually, you guys have just read the book of Judges. Question, was there a king in Israel during the period of Judges? And every man did that which is right in his own eyes, and there was what? No king in Israel. Okay? So there's no king in Israel. Moses tells them that they will have a king. 
Moses tells them that they will have a king. In Deuteronomy 17, he sets it up for the king. And here's what he says. When you enter the land your Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us have a king over us like the nations around us. By the way, is that exactly what they would say? You guys are going to be reading the book of Samuel this week. This is exactly what they would say. We want a king like the other nations around us. Moses said, okay, it's okay for you guys to have a king. You're going to have a king. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. So God's going to be involved in the selection of the king, and he must be from your own brothers. Question, does the king have to be Jewish? He's got to be one of your own brothers. He's got to be born Jew kind of thing. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king must, moreover, not do three things. So there's three things that a king should not do. Okay, Three things a king should not do. First of all, Moses says, he should not acquire a great number of horses. He shouldn't multiply horses. Now, what's the deal with multiplying horses? Horses back in those days are what? instruments of war, and he basically said, don't multiply, because if they did that, their trust would be in what? Would their trust be in God, or would their trust be in their horses for war? And so he says, no, don't multiply horses. I want you to trust me, not in the strength of your horses, and then go back to Egypt, because Egypt was one of the places where they got their horses from. He says, I don't want you going back to Egypt and things. I want you, no, don't multiply horses, okay? Number two, he says, don't multiply wives, don't multiply wives. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. Can you tell me a king of Israel who had many wives and his heart was led astray? Solomon or Shlomo, okay? Solomon uh, was, had, what, was it 700 wives and 300 concubines? And some people say he was supposed to be a smart man. <laughs> Anyways, uh, sorry, we'll get into Solomon later on. Solomon's, actually, I've spent half my life studying Solomon and that narrative of Solomon is really interesting. Us. There's a great deal of irony and upside downness in Solomon. Okay, the wisest man turns out to be the what? Yeah, and so you get this connection that wisdom and folly are actually are on the backside, can actually be connected in certain ways. And so, okay, but anyways, don't multiply wives, okay, because they'll lead your heart astray. That's exactly what happened with Solomon with his 700 wives and his 300 concubines. And then the third thing that you're not supposed to multiply, and this is critical, I think, for our age, is basically do not multiply silver and gold. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. The king is not to use his position of authority to acquire and accumulate gold and silver for himself. Okay? Do people use their position to accumulate stuff for themselves? And, and Moses says, no, the king should not be acquiring stuff. Because, by the way, where does the king get all his silver and gold? Does he get it from the people? And so this, this, Moses says, no, the king should not acquire a large amount of silver and gold for himself. Now, by the way, did Solomon have a lot of gold, gold and silver? Was that a gift from God? And so you got Solomon, it's an interesting kind of mix there. Um, and we'll have to look at that later. So no multiplying horses, no multiplying wives, no multiplying silver and gold. The king is not to do those things. Now, what is the king to do? That's what he's not to do, multiply those three things. What is the king to do? And basically, there's one commandment for the king. He is, it says this in verse 18, chapter 17, verse 18. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a, on a scroll a copy of this law. He is to write on a scroll a copy of this law. Okay, So the king himself is to make a handwritten copy of the law. Why is he to do that? Taken from the priests and Levites. It is to be with him. He is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and to follow carefully all the words of this law and, its dec and these decrees. He's to write the law so that he'll know the law so that he can rule according to the law. And so the king is to personally write a copy of the law so that he'll know the law to rule according to the law of Moses. Okay, So this is a king. Was Israel to have a king? Yes. Did, did God, through Moses, tell them they would have a king like the other nations? Yes. Before the king, who was their king? Before the king himself, God was their king. But God tells them that they're going to have a human king. 
God tells them they're going to have a human king. He's not to multiply those three things. He's to make a copy of the law. Who would ultimately be the human king over Israel? Like forever. Jesus will be the king of Israel kind of thing. But Jesus will stand as whose son? As the king of Israel. David's son. Is David going to be the king of Israel? David will be the king of Israel, and Jesus will stand as David's greater son, so to speak. Okay, David, Jesus is the son of David, the king of Israel. And so you'll get that kind of stuff going on with Jesus. Okay, priests and Levites, another institution that Moses kind of sets up here. Priests and Levites. What's the problem with priests and Levites? Chapter 18, verse 2. Okay, it says, They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The priests and Levites got no land. They did not receive land from the Lord. All the other tribes, all the other tribes get land. The Levites are not to have any land. Why? What was their inheritance? The land was not their inheritance. The text here says, you get no inheritance among your, their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance. So the Levites and priests, who, what was their inheritance? They got, didn't get the land. They got Levitical cities. They got Levitical cities but that they didn't get the land, the Lord was their inheritance. And so, um, anyway, so priests and Levites. Are the priests and Levites going to be scattered all over Israel then? Scattered all over Israel in these Levitical cities. I believe there's 48 Levitical cities scattered through. So there'll be priests and Levites scattered all over. And one of the jobs of the priests and Levites then will be to teach the law. One of the jobs of the priests and Levites will be to teach the law. They're scattered all through Israel and that kind of thing. So, these are the major institutions that Moses is on Mount Nebo. He can't go over into the Promised Land, so he sets up these institutions ahead of time. Do you see that the book of Deuteronomy is like a constitution? Setting up the institutions that will run the government for the next hundreds and hundreds of years. Moses sets that up, and these are the institutions he sets up. And, um, okay, now, this is where it starts to get tricky, okay? In Deuteronomy chapter 22, how do you take the law from back then to the 21st century? How do you take the Mosaic law and apply it to today? How does it fit the Mosaic law? How do you go from the back then, 1400, 1300 BC, how do you go to the 21st century AD? How do you make that 3,000 year jump then? How do you go from back then till now? Let me just give an illustration of this. Uh, on women, hmm, okay. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5 says this, on women and pants. Should women wear pants? Deuteronomy 22, verse 5 says this, a woman must not wear men's clothing. Pants, the man wears the pants, the family. Pants are men's clothing. Women should not wear men's clothing, so women shouldn't wear pants. Now, let me just give you an example of that. We got back from Israel, and I got my first job teaching in a Bible college in Bristol, Tennessee, and I loved it down there. And uh, so my wife, um, I was working. I was working at the school during the week. I was to be honest, I was making five thousand dollars working eighty hours a week, and that's not much money. And so what I do is I do on the weekend. We I do preaching and stuff like that. We were youth group sponsors at church and stuff. Uh, my wife, uh, she was an English major in college, but we got there, and there was this large church, probably 2,000-member church, and do a lot of the big churches have schools associated with them. And so this pastor was over this school, and so the pastor read this verse from Scripture that said, a woman must not wear men's clothing. And he said, pants are men's clothing, therefore all the girls that went to the school had to wear skirts and pants, or, or skirts, they could not wear pants. My wife was teaching there, and so that meant what? She had to wear a skirt all the time. Now, my wife, to be honest with you, the first probably years that I dated her, we were back in the like uh, early 70s, late 60s kind of thing, and so therefore all the girls wore blue jeans. I wore blue jeans. I never barely saw her in a dress before we got married. And, you know. So anyways, so now she's got to wear a dress every day to work. And she was an English major, so they had her teaching, what was she teaching, algebra? She was an English major, algebra. She was a gym teacher. She's a gym teacher. She came home one day saying, this girl slid into second base. Now, what's the problem when you slide into second base and you're wearing a like, the thing called culottes and stuff? This girl ripped her legs all up. My wife came home saying, just shaking her head, said, this girl's going to have scars on her leg for the rest of her life because she was, you know, not, she didn't have pants on to slide into first base. Yeah, Hannah. I don't know if it's too bad. I mean, the men's clothing is what you find in the men's section of the store. 
Okay, yeah. And the worst right. problem is what you find the women's section of surf. It's pants. They're girl pants, you know. Okay, well, all right. Let's push this a little. So, so my wife has to wear a dress all the time. We're youth group sponsors, okay? So we, what do good Christian people do? We go out bowling, right? So we got the youth group out bowling. So my wife, my wife knows how to bowl fairly well. And so my wife goes up, grabs the ball and stuff. She runs down there and pitches the ball and stuff. She's got a skirt on. All of a sudden, man, her dress like flips up. And it's like, holy cow, now keep it down. I got these, you know, 16, 17-year-old kids here, you know, like, keep it down, you know. It's just like, holy cow, we don't want any free shows on here. So anyways, so I, I kind of pull her aside and I give her this thing about, you know, you got to, you can't bowl like that anymore. It's too revealed stuff. So then my wife has to go up and bowl like this, you know. She goes up and throws the ball down. I won that day. That was the <laughs> way to get it done. But anyways, but the problem was, I, I always told her, I'd said, I'd, I'd pay that pastor's wife 50 bucks to see her snow ski in a dress. Wouldn't that be funny? It was going downhill. Anyways, but uh, was he taking, was he taking Deuteronomy 22.5 and applying it to today? Now, by the way, the way he applied it was a kind of crazy. Yeah, we, I think all of us would acknowledge it was absolutely crazy. Uh, by the way, did my wife wear a skirt for that whole year? Actually, two years. Did she wear a skirt for those two years? The honest truth is she did. Question, can we fit into different cultures? That's a different culture than we're used to, okay? And so they were very strict on this, and so my wife wore a thing. The same way, when I was a Mennonite, I went, I went to a Mennonite church, and I had to preach on Father's Day, and they told me that the Mennonites don't wear ties because they think the ties are worldly. Actually, I think that's good. That's, good. that's why I want to wear a tie. Uh, no, actually, I, I had to teach for 22 years with a tie wrapped around my throat and stuff. I couldn't stand it, so when I hear, I swore I'd never wear one again. But anyways... But no, when I went to the Mennonite church, did I, go with the, and did I go with the King James Version? Because that's what they accepted, a King James Version. So I'm saying is, when you're in different cultures, when you're in Israel, you put a keep on your head, you know what I'm saying? When you're in different cultures, you fit in. And so my wife wore a dress for, for two years there, and you know, it's no big deal, okay? Those are minor things. But did we disagree how the pastor interpreted the scriptures there? Yeah, we disagreed with how he interpreted the scripture there, but he was the pastor of the church, and so you, you fit in and things. Now... How do you go from the back then to now? We, we all have the sense of that that wasn't right. Let me read the rest of this verse to you. So then do we say, this verse is stupid. It's not talking about pants. By the way, what did guys wear back then? By the way, do we know what men and women wore back then? Do we know that for sure? The answer is the Ben Hasi uh, image thing. We've, we've got pictures of people. And did women wear like robes down to their ankles? Did guys wear robes down here? So guys wore skirts. So what does that mean? We all got to start wearing, we're going to dress just like they dressed? Okay, that's why the guys, they said, has anybody ever heard this? You gird up your loins? And stuff. Basically, you take up your garment and you tuck it in your belt because when you're running, you don't want to trip over this crazy robe that's around. And they wear these heavy robes and stuff. And so you gird them up. And, and that's the way men. Now, are we, do we have to dress the same way they dress? By the way, it's part of the way they dress because of the environment that they live in. Yeah, and we live in a different environment. So you can't go directly doing these things. And so, um, by the way, is this really what this is talking about? Let me read. So then you say, well, you, this verse is irrelevant to us. And just throw it out. Is it really irrelevant to us? Let me read the verse to you. See if, how you would apply it. It says this. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. For the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. What is this really talking about? Yeah, is it fairly clear? Uh, I had a friend at another school where I taught and stuff, and he used to put balloons in certain parts of his body and, and wear nylons and stuff, and he used to go to the mall, walk around the mall. He liked the way people would look at him and stuff like that. Was he a little bit... Yeah, he was, uh, but he was a friend of mine and stuff. Is that, is that more what this verse is talking about? Okay, that's what this verse is talking about. It's not talking about pants versus skirts. So how do you go from the back then till the now? This passage is talking about what? The differentiation between the sexes. I think Hannah hit it right on when you said, if you go there, are, are women's pants different than men's pants? As far as I, I, yeah, okay, so, you know, you work with that. The real issue is the differentiation of the sexes, that there not be this confusion of the sexes. But by the way, we live in America, do we confuse everything? Yeah, we kind of like it, right? But uh, this is no, you know, male, female, separate things, stuff. Well, this is a bigger question, and this one's really tricky. What is the impact of culture on the law? What is the impact of culture on the law? When I, when I was young, I thought God came down on Mount Sinai 
And God said, I am God, here is my law, wham, bam, this is my law. This is the way I want it done, this is the perfect law of God, and this is it. Totally ignoring culture, God says, this is how I want this world to work, and just came down and said, this is a... does God in his law take account for culture? And so what I'm wanting to suggest to you here is there's much more of an interactivity now that I see between culture and law. And we'll just we'll show some examples of that. The king uh, was to involve himself in writing the law and making copies of the law. Uh, do we have a king today? No, no, we don't, okay? Uh, we threw off King George and stuff. We don't have a king. And so the king was to write a law. Does our king, is he supposed to write a law, you know, cop, make a hand copy for himself? He doesn't have to. He's got it in his... As a Blackberry or what I had anyway, so okay. What's Christ's view of the law? So I want to look first just at Christ's view of the law and then contrast that with Paul's view of the law and then come back to the question of law and culture. What does Jesus say? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says this. Okay, get over to the page here. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. Okay, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, which is a yod, a y letter, it's half a letter, uh, or the least stroke of the pen, a jot or tittle. Does anybody remember what King James used to say? A jot or tittle will pass from the law to all be filled. A tittle is a serif. Do you guys know serif versus sans serif fonts? Like an Ariel is sans serif, whereas a Times New Roman, have you seen the little serifs that come off the letters on the, you know, the T's and the P's and all that stuff? They'll have the little serifs on them, things like that. A serif is what's called a tittle. It's just a little wingding that comes off the letter. And he says, not the smallest letter, the, even a wing ding will come off these till the law is fulfilled <laughs> and stuff. So actually, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. He didn't really say it like that, but okay. So does Jesus, how does Jesus defend himself against Satan? In Matthew chapter 4, just back a page here, Jesus is out tempted in the desert. He's been fasting for 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness. Who comes to challenge him? Satan comes to him and says, hey, Jesus, you've been fasting for 40 days. You hungry, Jesus? You got some stones here, Jesus. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? And does Jesus say, Satan, I know who you are. Watch this. I'm going to blink my eyes, and your molecules are going to go like on each galaxy. I'm going to just, bam, and you're out of here. Okay, did you? No, he didn't do that. What did Jesus do? Turn these stones into bread? Jesus says what? Man does not live by what? By bread alone. But by what? but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy. Turn these stones to bread, Satan says. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. He's quoting Deuteronomy 4 to Deuteronomy 8 in that section there. Satan takes Jesus up to a mount, uh, to the top of the pinnacle of the temple, to the highest point of the temple, and says, Jesus, throw yourself down because, and by the way, does Satan quote scripture? Satan actually quotes scripture and says, Jesus, throw yourself down. The, it says in the book of Psalms that his angels will bear you up. Jesus turns to Satan and says, no, I'm not going to throw myself down. You shall not do what to the Lord your God? You shall not test or tempt the Lord your God. Where does that come from? The book of Deuteronomy. He's quoting again the book of Deuteronomy saying, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Finally, Satan takes him up to the highest mountain, possibly Mount Hermon or something, Highest mountain shows him all the kings of the world, says, bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all these kingdoms will be yours. Jesus says what? You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Is he quoting Deuteronomy chapter 5 now to the Ten Commandments? All three times when Jesus goes to defend himself against Satan, he quotes from Deuteronomy to defend himself. Christ uses scripture to defend himself against Satan. Question, do we need to use scripture to defend ourselves against Satan? Seems to make sense, okay? Jesus uses Deuteronomy all three times in the temptation of Christ to defend himself. Jesus, did Jesus have a very high view of the law? When Jesus was asked, what is the most important thing in the law? What did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind. And then what? Love your neighbor as yourself. The two great commandments, they come out of where? Love the Lord your God? It's the Shema, Shema Yisrael, hero Israel. And you shall love the Lord your God. 
Okay, and Deuteronomy, where's the other one from? Does anybody remember that one? Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, does anybody remember where that's from? Love your neighbor as yourself. Did you, you guys memorize that, didn't you? I, th I thought I had you memorize it, okay. It's Levitic Leviticus chapter 19, right? Leviticus chapter 19. Love, love your neighbor as yourself comes from Leviticus. So Christ's greatest commands, both of those are from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The permanence of the law, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but what? The law, not a jot or tittle, will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. So the law is permanent. The permanence of the law, Jesus affirms that as well. Now, does Jesus critique the law? Some people look at the Sermon on the Mount here, and the Sermon on the Mount can be interpreted different ways, and there's, there's a whole, whole literature, actually, on the Sermon on the Mount, just hundreds of different ways, of wonderful ways of meaning in the Sermon on the Mount. But one of the ways of looking at it is Jesus says, you have heard it said of old time, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, whoever is angry at his brother without a cause committed murder already in his heart. So what does Jesus do? Jesus takes the law and drives it into the heart. Jesus takes the law and applies it to the heart. His objection is not to the law itself, but his objection is to the Pharisaic misinterpretation of the law. His objection is not to the law itself, but to the Pharisaic misinterpretation of the law. And he drives it into the heart. So he says, what? You have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus says, whoever looked on a woman lustfully has committed adultery already in his heart. So is Jesus affirming the law by driving it into the heart and saying that the very motives count here? So this is, does Jesus have a very high view of the law? And if a person's a Christian, are you going to have a high view of the law? If you're a Christ follower, did Jesus have a very high view of the law? So that's my point here. Now, what about Paul? Paul, if you go over to chapter in Galatians, Paul that brings up this, this law and gospel thing in, in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, I just want to read this verse for you. Is Paul so positive on the law? Paul says, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. Let me read that again. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. In other words, if you, if you try to use the law to be justified, then you're alienated from Christ. So there's this tension between Christ and the law and have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen, if you use the law like that, you've, been, you've fallen away from grace. So that's really kind of a negative thing in the law, that the law actually takes you away from Christ. So Paul, in the book of Galatians, is going to have some problems with the law. Now you say, well, is Paul negative on the law? And the answer is no, because if you go over to Romans chapter 7, verse 12, Paul says the law is holy, righteous, and good. So Paul, in Romans, says that the law is holy, righteous, and good. But in Galatians, he tells them if they use the law to earn their salvation that way, that then, then grace is of no, no good to them, and they've actually taken, taken them away from Christ. So there's this tension in Paul in terms of the goodness, holy, righteous, and good law, and this law that he talks about in Galatians, and he gets uh, pretty negative, the condemn condemnatory nature of the law in Galatians chapter 3. Let me just turn over the page here, 3.10. It says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God. No one is justified be before God by the law. Because Why? No one is justified by the law because the righteous will live by what? By faith. Now I ask, does anybody know where that passage comes from? It says, the righteous will live by faith. Does anybody know where that's from? That's a fairly important concept in the Bible. The righteous will live by faith. It's an Old Testament quote. Does anybody know the book of Habakkuk? Sure enough, it's in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a wonderful, if you ever got some time, it's a short book, three chapters, it's a wonderful book, and in that book it says the righteous will live by faith. But by the way, you know somebody else who's also righteous will live by faith. Paul says the law never justified anybody. The law 
never justified anybody. Let me read that Romans 4.3 uh, contrast over there with Romans 4.3. Paul says this. What does the scripture say? Abraham, Abraham kept the law. He was circumcised, and God then counted it for righteousness. Is that what it says? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now, why is Abraham such a brilliant, is Paul brilliant? Paul is absolutely brilliant here. Why is his using of Abraham absolutely brilliant? Is Abraham before or after the law? Abraham is like hundreds of years before the law. Is Abraham the great one for circumcision? Was Abraham the one where the, where the covenant was instituted by his being circumcised and solemnized by that? Okay? Now, Abraham then introduces in the, the circumcision thing. Is the, was Abraham saved by keeping the law, by being circumcised? No, the scripture tells us clearly Abraham was justified by what? Let me just read that again. This is a really important bit. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for what? For righteousness, okay? And so Paul goes back to Abraham, because do all the Jewish people claim that Abraham is their father? It's kind of like our father Abraham, okay? And so what he does is he goes back to Abraham to kind of precede Moses and says, Abraham was saved by faith, and you guys are saved by faith, not by keeping the law. The law is meant... And this is, this is the fundamental problem. Is the law meant to show us how good we are? No. The law is meant to show us what our sin. And what happened is the Pharisees took the law and did they turn it on its head? That the law now is to show us how good we are, not to show us our sin. And what Paul's saying is, no, no, you're, you're misunderstanding. All. The law's purpose was to show us our sin, not to show us how good we are. The law shows us our sins so that we turn to what? Christ is Savior. That's the function of the law. The law shows us we're sinners, and then we need a Savior. And that's how the law then, and this is the next point, I believe, the law is, has a pedagogical function. The law is a mentor. The law is a schoolmaster, I think, is a King James. The law is a schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. The law brings us to Christ because we realize our sin, and we realize now we need a Savior. So the law should set us up to bring us to Christ, to show us our own frailties, to show us our own sin, so that we turn to Christ. So that's the function of the law. The function of the law is to show us our sin, not to show that we're righteous. Okay, now, what still stands? Let me have you conceptualize the law like this. This is what I was taught growing, when I was growing up, this is what I was taught, okay? And I think it's useful, but not totally useful, and you'll see me critique it and stuff in a minute. But just think through this. People take the law, the five books of Moses, and they say certain parts of the law of Moses are civil laws. They're civil laws. They're laws for the government. They're laws for the government. Do you need law? Does a government need laws? A government needs laws, okay, unless you're an anarchist or something. But the, the government needs laws, okay? Um, one of the laws that Israel had was that if you had a house and you had a, a flat roof, all their houses are flat roofs, that you put a parapet around the, you put a, like a, a little wall around the, the, the roof of your house. Now, why would you do that? Yeah, so if the person's up there, they just don't go walk and bam, fall off your roof and then hurt themselves and stuff. So the law, you were required by the law to put a parapet around the house. By the way, do you see that that is a safety requirement? that a nation would want, you know, saying so people don't get hurt on that. And by the, by the way, is that so far-fetched? Now, how many of you put a par parapet around your roof? Now, you say, you, we live in New England. All our roofs are like this. Why are our roofs like this? Yeah, the rain runs down, and what's worse than the rain sometimes? The snow goes off your roof. Question, you got a flat roof in New England. Have you got a problem? Oh, no, seriously. Just look at Frost Hall, okay? So what you want is like this. So the question, do we need parapets around our roofs? None of you go up to meditate on your roof, do you? Or actually, I've been up on top of my roof. Um, it's actually, I've got a real steep roof. It's about 50 feet up there. And uh, I've sat right on the top of the thing. And uh, it, no, I was actually nailing on uh, shingles. My shingles came off, and so I had to nail it down upside down. There was nobody there to help me. And I realized if I fell, 
Um, it was one of the few times in my life where I'm not usually as scared, afraid of heights, and I, I realized that my sons, none of my kids are around, so if I did fall, there was no one there to help me. And so it was just uh, it was kind of a different thing for me at this age of my life. That stuff, I'm thinking twice about heights now, which is disgusting. Anyway, so now, civil law. Now, let me go back to this. I've got a neighbor. A question, what about this parapet around the, parapet around the roof? We said we don't have. Our roofs are all like this now. Okay, our roofs are... What about, my neighbor's got a pool. My neighbor's got a pool. Question, does he have to put a fence around his yard to protect so the kid doesn't walk over and fall in the pool? Is that part of our, is that pretty much the same law, to protect people from harm? And as you, as a homeowner, are you responsible to be responsible to make sure people don't get hurt on your property? And so they put a fence around a pool today, and that's uh, it's per very similar to the same type of law. So there are civil laws, okay? There are civil laws, these are for the government. Now question, are you the government? Do you have to follow those laws? We're not really the government. The Jews also had ceremonial laws. Ceremonial laws are what? The laws of the, uh, of the priests and Levites. This is how you do sacrifices, how you do sacrifices, how you do uh, feasts, how you do feasts. Uh, what was the word we used for the rituals? We would use in English these words rituals. The rituals are prescribed in the law, the rituals that the priests go through. What was the other word that we used in Old Testament circles? It's a real important word in Old Testament today. The ceremonial or the ritual we call what? The cult in the Old Testament. Remember we used that word cult in the Old Testament? The cult is these external acts of worship, the rituals that you go through, and that's the ceremonial law. Now question, how many of you have sacrificed anything lately? Okay, I mean like a real, set, you know, like sheep and goats, okay? Do we do, do we do the ceremonial laws anymore? Do we do, are we priests and Levites? Is the temple gone? The temple's gone, right? The altar's gone. So we don't do the ceremonial laws and that kind of stuff. So we do, the civil laws are governmental laws. We're not really government. The ceremonial laws has to do with the priests and their sacrifices. We're not really. So what do we focus on? In the Old Testament, we focus on the moral law. Now, are there certain parts of the law, the Old Testament, that are, are moral? Like, how should, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie. Uh, are, those moral, are those moral precepts? Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, these types of things. And so what happens here is, a lot of people divide the law into three categories. Is this law civil? Is this law ceremonial? Or is this law moral? And then what the suggestion is, we don't necessarily keep these first two, but the third one, the moral law of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. We keep the moral law. And uh, so that's, uh, that's important there, okay? So we segment the law, and then how do we transfer the law over? We transfer the law over just the moral part of that law. Okay? Does that make sense then? Yeah. Does this make it does this make the law easier to handle? Because we've got the civil law that's for nations, we're not nations, ceremonial priests, we're not priests, and the moral law, that's what we follow. Okay, that's what I was taught growing up. Now let me critique that a little bit. My problem with this is, how do you determine whether a law is a civil, ceremonial, or a moral law? Sometimes are the ceremonial laws linked in with moral laws? Does the book of the law, Moses' first five books of the Bible, does it come to us as an organic whole? It comes to us organically connected. You just can't rip things off and put them into categories like that. Okay, You just can't rip... When you start ripping them apart and say, well, this is civil, this is ceremonial, and this is moral, you're, you're, you're dissecting the law. You can't do that. The thing is, is moral, okay? All right? In other words, it's immoral to do that. You can't just break things apart like that. Is putting a parapet around your wall, is that a moral issue? Yeah, actually it is. It's part of your responsibility as the one that owns a home. So it's, it's partially civil, but it's partially moral as well. Okay, so what I'm suggesting is that this, this categorization here does not, um, it violates the organic connection, the organic unity, the interaction with Scripture with itself. And, and while I like, are these categories useful? Are these categories useful? 
okay? The categories are useful, but I think you gotta be real careful lest it leads to dissecting, you know, splitting up and dissecting the law and stuff. So to be honest with you, I kind of hold, I like some of the idea of this, but you gotta, you gotta be careful, back it off some. Now, here's a better way, I think, that, of coming at this stuff, is what is the underlying universal principle what is the underlying universal principles of the law? For example, care for the poor. Is care for the poor in the Old Testament good? Is care for the poor in the New Testament good? Yes. And so you get these more universal principles. Love God, be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Are these universal principles? So what you do is you look at those universal principles that are transcultural. They go beyond culture. And they, you know what I'm saying, they... they they work in whatever culture. Each culture will manifest it differently, but it's basically the underlying principle will work in every culture and stuff. Cultural reparticularization. Now, what do I mean by cultural reparticularization? Do we struggle with Baal worship today? Does anybody really struggle with Baal? You know, in the Old Testament, they weren't supposed to worship Baal. We don't even know who Baal is anymore. Sacrifices, we don't do sheep and goat sacrifices, grain sacrifices anymore. Clean and unclean. Do we do clean and unclean? No, we don't really do that anymore. Altars, did their altars have to be built in a special way? Did the Jewish altars have to be built in a special way? Okay. Um, yeah, the Jews' altars were supposed to be built of uncut stone as compared to the Canaan altars which were built out of cut stone. So this is, uh, you know, this, okay, we don't build altars anymore, so these rules don't really apply to us. But then you've got to ask, do some of these laws... Can you go underneath the cultural particulars to a universal underlying principle? Can you take the cultural particular off and find the underlying universal principle? Okay? And that's the case with Baal worship. Would that have to do with idolatry? In whatever shape that takes place in your culture, it would have to take place with idolatry. Sacrifices. Jesus Christ dying for our sins and realizing sins and things like that. So this is... Uh, Okay, so what I'm suggesting is then that each, the Old Testament will have a culture. You've got to pull off sometimes the cultural particulars and look at the underlying principle. Okay, and now let me just do that a little bit more. This is the key then, I think, is this underlying principle rather than the cultural particular. Um, Jesus gives a model of this, I think, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you know, if your brother's angry with you, if you're angry with your brother in the heart, don't, uh, you know, you've committed murder already in your heart. And so Jesus basically takes the law and drives it into the heart, okay? So what I'm suggesting then is um, that this, how should I say, work with the principles that underlie the cultural particulars. Now, I'm going to make one more step. And this next step is um, actually discovered this a few years ago, and this is difficult. Um, did God accommodate himself to culture when he gave the law? Did God accommodate himself to culture? In other words, I originally thought that God, when he came down to Mount Sinai, gave his perfect law that this is, this is the way it's supposed to be like in heaven. This is actually, this is the perfect thing, and this is the way I want it run. But then I, I came across a statement in the New Testament in Jesus, that Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. And let me just read this to you. I think it, it's, it's transformed the way I look at the law. Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse 8, it says this. The question is on divorce, and it says this. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Did Moses allow for divorce? Deuteronomy chapter 24, Moses allows for a man to divorce his wife. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 24, Moses allows for divorce. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Question, is that perfect? Is that a perfect world? Moses allows for divorce. What does God say about divorce? In Malachi, God says, I hate divorce. Is that fairly clear? He says, I hate divorce. Okay, it's fairly clear what God thinks about, I hate divorce. You say, well, if God hates it in Malachi, why did Moses allow for it in Deuteronomy chapter 24? Jesus here tells us the why. Does Jesus know the why behind the law? Yeah, Jesus was like there, okay? So Jesus says this. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. Why? 
because your hearts were hard. Because your hearts were hard. Did God adapt his law because of the hardness of these people's hearts? Yeah, yeah. He doesn't, doesn't come down and say, this is my perfect law. You guys have to do this. He says, no, that perfect law is not going to work with these people because they're so stinking corrupt. Now, what's that mean? Many, many years ago, I taught this passage, and I was in a small college in the Midwest called Grace College. I went over this passage and I said, you know what Jesus means here is that basically guys are so corrupt, if you can't divorce your wife, what would men do to their wives? Till death do us part, we've promised and stuff, and therefore what would men do that can't divorce their wife, they hate their wife, they want to get rid of her, what would they do? they kill their wife, they kill their wife to be out of the marriage. And so I go off and I'm talking about this, you know, the guys, by the way, do people even in America, do some guys kill their wives to get rid of their wives? So I'm going off like this. This lady comes up to me afterwards, probably a 35-year-old woman comes up to me and she says, who told you? You're not supposed to know. Nobody here is supposed to know. How did you know? What, uh, you know, she's getting all this paranoid, suspicious stuff. I said, lady, I just made that example up, you understand? On this guy killing this wife. I wasn't referring to anything particular and stuff. She said, no, no, you were talking about me. You just laid out the whole situation. Who told you? And I said, well, uh, and, and basically what happened is this lady, no, just down, it's true, she was from Colorado. This is so many years ago, it doesn't matter now, but she was from Colorado. Her husband took out a hit on her. I forget what it was, $10,000 or whatever. She found out that her husband paid somebody to kill her. She found out about it. She took the kids and she fled to Indiana. We had these uh, places, I think they're called safe houses and stuff, where a woman can go with their family and stuff and be protected. And so she was at a safe house. Nobody was supposed to know where she lived or what happened. She was at a safe house and she was taking courses at a college, you know, trying to get her education and stuff like that. But had her husband, did her husband pay to have her killed? Yes, and she was fleeing from that. And so I'm saying, even till this day, you get this thing. Jesus says, because of the hardness of their heart. Did God adapt his law because these people's hearts were so hard? He didn't want these women getting killed. And so he said, hey, okay, you can do divorce. Because what? Now, by the way, is divorce God's perfect will? God says he hates divorce. But did he allow what he hated because he didn't want these people killed? Okay. And so what I'm saying is God adapted to the culture. Okay, so you've got to be careful. If you just say, God came down and gave us perfect, this is how it's supposed to be in heaven. This is how it, no, no, God said, these people are such sinners and stuff. I've got to adapt this, so they're going to kill each other and stuff. So it just, um, I don't know, that, that's shaped. Do you see how that changes then, how you look at the law that sometimes, you know, okay, it's got a law of divorce, but Jesus said, it's because of the hardness of your hearts that God did that that way in particular and stuff. So here's another thing I work with. I call cat. Canonical continuity and canonical clashing. Do certain parts of the Bible say that what, what's, okay, if I said to you lobster, clean or unclean? Unclean, okay. Catfish, clean or unclean? Unclean, okay. Did the Jews have real clean stuff and unclean stuff? But by the way, in the New Testament, does Peter, is, does Jesus in a vision tell Peter to get up and eat? And it's all unclean stuff. And Peter says, what? No, no, gee, I can't do that, God, because my, my mouth has never had anything unclean. In Acts chapter 15, and God says, get up and eat it. I don't call unclean what I've called clean. And Peter is told to eat all this non-kosher stuff in the New Testament because God's trying to show that, no, the kosher laws are passed now. If you're a Christian, you have to eat kosher. And the answer is no. Acts chapter 15 tells us, Acts chapter 15 tells us that we as Christians don't have to eat kosher, okay? And so some of the law gets changed, and, and so there's these canonical clashings, okay? The Old Testament did it this way. In the New Testament, we're not going to do it that way, and so there's clashings between. When you see those clashings, you know what? Is that part of the law cultural? Was it for that culture and not for our culture? So when you see the clashing, then, you can see these divergences in culture. The culture has changed, and therefore the law needs to be changed in some of this stuff. Yeah, Pete? Yeah, no, actually what I would, I would say is that the law is not passing away. What was the function of the, that law? Okay, the function of the law with the kosher, eating kosher food, was that a ethnic, cultural, how should I say, marker for the Jewish people that they were part of the Jewish community? 
And what's happening now is not passing away. The Jewish people, it's actually expanding because now the Gentiles are included in. And as therefore, because the Gentiles are including in, how should I say, it's expanded. In other words, you don't need these uh, cultural, ethnic identifiers anymore because the church is the whole world now. And so it's not passing away so much as expanding and, and being blown out in, how should I say, yeah, expanding. And in one sense, it's being fulfilled by, its, by being expanded, not... See, I say passing away meant that, that the law would be violated. In other words, in other words the law still is good. It, it's fulfilled its purpose. Its purpose was the identifying of the Jewish people, and now it's got to give way because that, that, that ethnic thing is giving way. It's not passing away. So I, I'm saying it would be expanding and going on greater. Than, uh, yeah, I don't know that I'd call it passed over. I want to say it would be fulfilled, and it's fulfilled in a, in a more comprehensive way, in a more expansive way. And so it's not like this is bad now, no, no, it, it had its place, it had its time, and now it's, it's actually still got its place in time, but it's being blown out now. It's being um, more comprehensive. But yeah, but the, the law, there, there are some things that change like that. The, the dietary laws are real clear because Acts 15 makes it real clear we don't have to eat kosher. And so you get that kind of thing. And so there's, a, there's continuity and there's discontinuity. Okay, and actually, that's actually what I want to have been saying. There's, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's continuity. There's also some aspects of discontinuity. And the discontinuity will often be in this fulfillment into the greater that's coming, you know what I'm saying? So it was here, it was, it was smaller, and then when you get in the church, it'll, it'll expand and becomes more comprehensive and things. So, yeah. Okay, now, um, is the law good or bad? Well, if the law leads you to legalism, the law is bad. If the law leads to legalism, it's bad. If a person finds security in performance, if they find security in performance, then the law is bad, okay? Because you're getting secure in the law, not in your faith in Christ, okay? The externalization of religion. The externalization of religion. If one keeps the law, and the law then gives them external markers that you're religious because you have these external markers, that again is not the function of the law and things. If the law leads you to feeling so good about yourself that you start condemning others because others don't keep the law, and you do keep the law, and therefore you start looking down your nose and condemning other people, that's not the function of the law either. So the law can be bad in that sense, that it can lead you to a sense that I'm better than other people, and largely lead you to this, to pride, that a person that keeps the law can actually get proud in the law and stuff. Hannah? Would it be better to say it was misused in those situations? Because the law yeah. is always better. Well... Yeah, no, I want to do it this way. So we'll do it this way. Okay. So pride, if law can lead to pride, the person taking the law and leading it to pride and stuff. Earning salvation. A person can take the law and said, if I keep the law, then I can earn my salvation. If a person earns their salvation, question, do they depend upon grace? So, okay, so the law can have these various functions, and the, even the term law is used in many different ways. So these are some negative ways that the law can be misinterpreted, misused, those types of things. Now, what about grace? What about grace? You said you speak very highly of grace. What about grace? Is grace good or bad? Grace can lead to license. A person can say, hey, the grace of God, God will forgive me, so I can go out and do this bad stuff that I know I shouldn't be doing, saying, well, God will forgive me, and therefore grace actually ends up being a, an enticement to sin because you figure God will forgive you and things. So, pardon? Pardon? Yes, yes, exactly. And Paul says grace is good, but if grace leads you to, you know, sin, God forbid, you know. And Paul says that stuff. I can do anything and I'll be forgiven. If a person has that mindset of I can do anything and I'll be forgiven, ah, very, very grace is leading you down the wrong road. And so grace has this negative things. This is the big one, the devaluing of sin. And this is actually a big problem, I think, in our culture. Our culture pushes grace. Our culture pushes grace, the disconnection between act and consequence. 
That is one of the biggest things in our culture that keeps many young people in, in foolishness rather than in wisdom, the disconnection of act and consequence, because they think they can act with no consequences. And the problem is there are consequences. And so sin is devalued. Sin is devalued. You always get a second chance. You always get a second chance. And so that kind of thing, and grace is bad. Now, okay, next time when we get to this section, we're going to talk about some laws that are very difficult. And one of those laws will be the laws of war. And so we want to talk about some laws that rattle our bones, and we'll hit those tough laws next time, okay? Take care. See you on Tuesday. This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his Old Testament History, Literature, and Theology course, lecture number 17 on the book of Deuteronomy, the institutions of Israel, and the various understandings of the concept of law.